that share a spatial and spiritual connection to the forest, land, biodiversity, and all the natural elements of Mother Earth. They view both themselves and the nature as inseparable part of extended ecological family. Although indigenous peoples comprise only around 6% of the global population, they protect 80% of world's biodiversity. Indigenous youth who are not just the future of the nation, but also believed as the present power bank in protecting their culture, livelihoods, knowledge, and the mother nature as a whole. They grow up with the education to respect the traditional knowledge, indigenous norms, and values which guide them to worship, nurture, nourish, and protect the forest, environment, human, and all the spaces existed in the earth. Forests are sacred sites for indigenous peoples where they live strong, they strongly believe that the spirit of nature and their ancestors live to guide them confronting challenges and to overcome any problems they face in their lives. The present generation, particularly indigenous youths, are blessed with both the power of traditional knowledge and the fruits of science. Nowadays, we have seen in Asia and other regions of the world that indigenous youths are uh, going for social entrepreneurship, using uh, and promoting their traditional knowledges and uh, natural resources from their localities. Um, and creating uh, more employment opportunities for indigenous youths and particularly women in the community. Um, although we have all the uh, blessed um, natural resources and the traditional, rich traditional knowledge, indigenous youth face different challenges while going for promoting traditional uh, knowledge and uh, you know, different youth-led um, entrepreneurship or solutions, because there are always some people, some corporate who always target indigenous people's lands to grab. And uh, we know that Asia, um, Asia's indigenous peoples, along with other regions, indigenous peoples are facing several uh, um, human rights violations in, uh, in the regions. So indigenous youths, if, even though they have a strong knowledge uh, that they um, learned from their community, from their elders, they still face many challenges, uh, even though they want to contribute uh, to solve the environmental, uh, the problems in terms of environment. Um, nowadays, we uh, see that indigenous youth are uh, trying to break the, uh, the, the, the tradition they had in the society that to go for the uh, traditional uh, jobs that are assumed uh, for the uh, public and private jobs only, but indigenous youths along with the other uh, mainstream youths in their countries, respective countries, they are now uh, trying to solve, solution, trying to find solution and bridging uh, them and connecting with their rights, indigenous people's rights, uh, protecting the mother nature and save the environment as well. Um, in this stage, uh, I encourage all the state state, all the governments and the, all the UN agencies to come forward to support indigenous youths, uh, to promote indigenous youth solutions uh, for climate and, and environmental challenges, as well as to protect the indigenous people's rights as a whole. Uh, therefore, protecting indigenous peoples and their rights means protecting the mother what? A mother earth. If we want to protect the mother earth, we must protect the indigenous peoples, um, indigenous peoples' right and their land and their tradition and the overall environment livelihoods they have. Um, on the celebration of World Environment Day, um, we believe that 
uh, not only indigenous peoples will promote the indigenous peoples rights and the uh, culture and tradition, but also the other communities uh, who are not indigenous along with the uh, government and the organization will come forward to protect these um, indigenous communities who contribute walls uh, uh, in rich culture as well as to the biodiversity and environment most. Uh, I will uh, stop here, Pirawan, over to you and thank you everyone for joining us today. Come by. Pira, when you were muted. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much, Shadda. Thank you for your uh, powerful opening remark and highlighting the role of indigenous youth in the, and also the importance in protecting indigenous people's right to land, territory, and resources. So let's not delay the time. Today, we're going to hear the story from our young indigenous people and also the development agency, the youth that uh, will be making change in their country and the community level. So I would like to start with our first panelist, who is the only uh, woman in, uh, our, as of our panelist now, uh, Ms. Uh, Basha Lecky. She is the young indigenous women environmental activist. She is passionate about research and advocacy for environment protection, as well as the rights of indigenous people and women. She was nominated as a goodwill ambassador, ambassador for Clean Up Nepal campaign. She worked as a national indigenous people fellow in the UNDP Jepsimo grant program. She is also appointed as an advisor in the Earth Day Network Nepal. Today, we're going to hear her story about the young indigenous women in preserving and promoting indigenous knowledge. Basha, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, B. Um, I'm so pleased to see you all and be a part of this webinar. First of all, I would like to extend uh, World Environment Day wishes to everyone. Uh, very hopeful to witness a restored ecosystem and restored earth. Beginning with my presentation, I would like the host to please share the screen with my presentation. I'm just waiting for my presentation to, yeah. Thank you, Piravan. Can you share your screen? Just a second, Basha. Yeah, can you hear me? Can you? Okay, sorry, that's a technical problem. Can you see the screen now? Yeah, yeah, I can see the screen now. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, so beginning uh, with my uh, presentation, I would uh, like to introduce myself. Uh, next slide, uh, David, please. Yeah, so Pirawan has already introduced me, he has given me uh, a brief introduction about uh, myself. So I would like to just skip this slide and keep the, save the time for the slides. Yeah, so talking about climate change and indigenous peoples, climate change and indigenous peoples relationship uh, is something that we have been hearing from a very long time from one, uh, from, from one other, other means, from various platforms through various peoples. So indigenous peoples have a very uh, close uh, really cultural re relationships uh, with the environment and natural resources, uh, basically to meet their livelihood needs. So climate change uh, poses threats to their livelihoods, uh, culture, identities, and at times habitat too. Um, well, so talking about the change uh, that we are focused in. So the, the basic meaning of change is becoming different or alter. But if any change is um, a threat to one's habitat or one's living, then I don't think it, it, we can coin that term as change. So we cannot call it climate change, but 
Kovike, you know, calling it climate crisis or climate emergency. So I saw this statement, don't call it change, call it climate emergency or crisis. I saw this statement in COP25, uh, where I participated back in 2019 in Madrid, Paris, so which I completely agree to, because um, we've seen uh, these change um, affecting or impacting indigenous peoples, the local communities uh, at various um, aspects or various um, magnitudes. The next slide. So talking about the issue and challenge, uh, we are adapting uh, modern technology while losing the traditional ones. Uh, in the race of modernism, uh, we're losing the sense of traditional view of living, which actually is a sustainable approach. So losing indigenous knowledge or traditional practices and cultural uh, values uh, will, would be difficult to revert back to its original state or probably difficult to achieve resilience. So we need to revive all the traditional practices that we have been following uh, from millennia for, uh, uh, by our ancestors and uh, to adapt the techniques of natural resource management, farming, and emphasize on cultural importance of nature and natural products. Um, all we need to do is uh, synchronize traditional techniques with modern scientific uh, ones so that you know, it becomes more effective and efficient and, and it increases efficiency. Next slide, please. <laughs> yeah. So uh, if you see on the right-hand side, uh, there is this uh, tabular interpretation of um, um, indigenous knowledge erosion theory. So there are different components. You, you can see not, uh, component number one is knowledge holder, which are our ancestors, our forefathers. Second component is training, the youth, us, the next generation. Third is practice and fourth is resources. So um, all these components are drivers of indigenous uh, knowledge or probably its erosion. So this table was uh, taught to me or passed on to me by Vivek sir when I was working uh, with, uh, as, as a fellow of Small Grants Program. So this is the basic idea uh, that talks about four parameters or components uh, that, that has to function parallelly uh, for indigenous uh, knowledge to sustain for, you know, for, uh, to combat erosion of uh, indigenous knowledge. So traditional knowledge or the indigenous knowledge that we're talking is the knowledge or innovation or practices uh, by indigenous and local communities around the world. Uh, these knowledge were developed from the experiences again over millennia, from the years uh, and adapted to the local culture and environment. So the problem is that uh, traditional knowledge is transmitted orally from generation to generation. So what happens is if there is no documentation, we do not, uh, we cannot go back or refer to the knowledge, uh, what our forefathers or, an, or, or our ancestors had. So these, uh, so <coughs> basically the indigenous uh, knowledge uh, document, uh, documentation started not more than three to four decades. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so to, um, so this is Baidava. I would just uh, tell you briefly what Baidava is and how Baidava is related to indigenous knowledge or uh, the, uh, the uh, my, my action. So yeah, Baidava are uh, Tharu traditional medical practice practitioners or traditional doctors. Uh, they are respected in their communities providing health services. As per indigenous knowledge of Tharu community or Tharus, more than 600 species of medical uh, medicinal plants are used for the treatment of uh, various ailments. So each Baidava is specialized for different ailments, including paralysis, pancreatic stones, removing pancreatic stones, arthritis, uh, snake bites, fever, high blood pressure, etc. So most of the Baidavas uh, do not really uh, charge uh, for a diagnosis or you know service fee, they just charge for medicines that too comparatively is very low uh, compared to uh, pharmaceutical ones. So on the right hand side you can see the picture of uh, which which says the Baidya Khana. Uh, that is where uh, the Baidava provides uh, health service. Next slide, please. Yeah, so the knowledge erosion that I was talking about in the previous slide, in the earlier slide, this is a very good example of how knowledge has been transferred from generation to the younger generation. 
This picture um, is uh, of Baidava, uh, namely Ram Krishna Chaudhary and his family. So Ram Krishna Chaudhary is a Baidava who is a traditional doctor in Katarnia village in Baidya district, uh, which lies in Western Tarai of Nepal. So his entire family, including both of his sons and his wife, serve, serves as Baidava in his village. So his wife is uh, serves as Sodini, uh, who actually serves as a postpartum period through massages. So he is uh, Ram Krishna Chaudhary, by the way. Uh, he specialized in removing pancreatic stones as well as uh, treating uh, patients with allergy, gastric, jaundice, um, et cetera, using, herbal med uh, using medicinal herbs. So basically he got this, uh, he inherited this knowledge from his father. And now he has been passing on this indigenous knowledge of uh, medicine plants and treatment and massages to his uh, sons. So his elder son is a uh, medical doctor. So whenever a patient with uh, you know, pancreatic stone comes to his clinic, he refers it to his uh, brothers or his father so that the stone is removed uh, you know, using uh, herbally or using medicinal plants. So this is one of the very good example of how uh, indigenous knowledge has been uh, transferred to, to one generation to the other. The next slide, please. Um, yeah, so uh, <laughs> documentation of indigenous knowledge uh, is very important because uh, it plays a vital role to counter indigenous knowledge, the loss of indigenous knowledge. Documentation is very important, as I said in earlier slide, that only one component is not enough. So education um, alone or um, uh, this sharing of uh, indigenous knowledge to younger generation is not enough, but continuing this traditional practice um, similarly, all the components uh, is equally play vital role. So, um, as I said, education, dissemination of knowledge to younger generation, continuing the traditional practices, and ensuring availability of resources. Example, uh, for example, uh, if you need uh, that, that that particular plant for medicinal purposes, you can just plant those herbs. So, in this way, conservation of the plant can also uh, be promoted and also indigenous species of plants that helps in uh, conservation. Another way uh, can be green enterprise. Um, again, uh, while working in a small grants program, I encountered youth of Japan community who initiated this honey business. Uh, well, I'm not going in detail because I ensured that this will be covered by Vivek Sir in his presentation later in this webinar. So what I'm trying to emphasize here is that developing green enterprise can be one of the innovative solution to combat climate change, achieve sustainable development, and um, in total, heal Earth. Next slide. Yeah, so talking about my action, uh, during my fellowship with Small Grants Program, Jeff UNDP, I studied various projects project profiles that engaged indigenous people's participation at local, le local level. So I supported traditional doctors locally known as Baidava that I've already described in my earlier slides. So we um, by introducing technology. So this, uh, we provided solar dryer. So the technology was a renewable technology, which was a solar dryer. We, pro we uh, provided solar dryer to seven, seven Baidawa in Bardia district to help them dry medicinal herbs in any season, especially during rainy and winter seasons. So with the dryer, the Baidawas are now um, are able to provide medicinal herbs to patients without worrying about its decay or deterioration. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so this is the group picture uh, where uh, the mayor of the the, the, the village is, is giving the solar dryer to one of the Baidava. Next slide. Yeah, so I was talking about uh, indigenous knowledge documentation. So this was one of the video documentation. I made uh, a 12 minute uh, documentary video, which is uploaded on YouTube regarding Baidava and their practice. Like how did they gain this knowledge and how uh, are they running this uh, kind of practice and about their livelihood. Etc. So uh, please feel free to go and watch this on YouTube, uh, and you do not have to worry. The video is in English subtitles for you to understand. And on the right hand side, you can see uh, I've put the screenshot of the comments. 
So what happened is uh, when I uploaded this video on YouTube, there were many queries regarding the service of traditional doctors, uh, you know, um, treating their patients with medicinal herbs. So how, this was one of the way how I uh, helped in communicating uh, the patients with these by the way. So, you know, all these internet uh, services that we're giving is one of the way how we can document and share and promote these kind of uh, practices, indigenous practices. Um, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so as I mentioned, uh, this is the link to the uh, YouTube video. You can watch it later. And other than, uh, other than a video documentation, I compiled 10 different stories of various indigenous-led projects and entrepreneurship. Uh, so this uh, short stories uh, would help uh, encourage readers to uh, you know, motivate them to open up their own enterprise or project or any kind of a startup. Uh, this would uh, be basically, you know, give a brainstorm to their um, enterprise as well. Yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, so this is my social indigenous enterprise. Uh, you can see in the picture, um, I'm wearing this uh, Tharu traditional jewelry called Hasuli. It is called Hasuli in Tharu in local language. Um, so the basic idea was to um, reduce waste from trash to treasure. So I, uh, so I started producing uh, this imitation indigenous Tharu jewelry and, uh, and my craftsmen are indigenous Tharu itself. And these are made by recycled beer cans. So, you know, these are handmade. However, polishing, is, uh, polishing and crafting is there, but all uh, the entire processes are handmade. So this not only reduces the existing waste, but also preserves uh, Tharu indigenous jewelry. So, you know, uh, there are two things that I did from this project. One was reducing existing waste, and second was preserving Tharu indigenous um, jewelry. So next slide, please. <coughs> yeah, so another way of tackling um, how youth action can be done is the best use of uh, internet is, you know, we have new technology which spreads quickly, you know, within a, a, a seconds of time. So how we can do it is by communicating, find answers, access to information and socializing. Second is communication. It is a very essential tool to connect to people. Uh, like, you know, like I said, my YouTube video was one of the medium to connect uh, patients to Bhairavas. So youth with video skills can make video documentation or vlogs and post it in their social media platforms. Second can be, you know, youth with um, good writing skills can write blogs and articles. Also, social media plays an important uh, platform where uh, people can communicate, share, aware, and discuss. And also, nowadays, we've observed that TikTok is one of the blooming uh, apps where, you know, marketing has been uh, tremendously booming. So, you know, all these platforms can be efficiently and effectively used. Um, yeah, so uh, next slide, please. I guess, yeah, so my time's up and so is my presentation. Um, if you have any questions, you can comment down or I shall reply. And for further queries, you can connect me to me to these platforms that I've uh, given in this uh, slide. My social media handles are for my name, Barsha Lehi. So let's get connected. Uh, thank you so much, over to P. Over to you, Piravan. Thank you very much for the nice story about how the importance of the indigenous knowledge. And we really need to keep practicing this if we want to uh, preserve this uh, indigenous knowledge. No? Without practicing and without the resources, then the, our knowledge is gone. No? And you also highlighting the role of indigenous youth in using the technologies and also social media in promoting and preserving this knowledge. No? Thank you very much, Basha, for your inspiring story. Uh, next, uh, I would like to uh, go to another uh, side of the region. This is the uh, Mekong region. Uh, I would like to introduce you to uh, Mr. Tai Wan. Wan. Sorry if, if my spelling is not correct. Uh, Mr. Tai is a researcher and lecturer at the Research Center of Rural Development of Anker University. Vietnam. He has led the, and participated in several research and development study uh, on gender, uh, national resources management, farm-based livelihood, disaster risk, 
climate change and community resilience. And today, Mr. Tai is going to share with us about the indigenous knowledge in adapting to the climate change, the story from Vietnam. Mr. Tai, the time is yours. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, can you see the screen right now? Yes. Yes. Ah, yes. Okay, right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone from uh, Vietnam. Um, it's my pleasure uh, to be uh, in the webinar and also it's uh, my chance uh, to share with all of you about uh, the flood and some of like natural disaster in the Mekong Delta of Vietnam. And uh, thank you, uh, Peter Wa, I can uh, uh, introduce uh, myself. Uh, at, yeah, probably like I just uh, briefly uh, introduce uh, I may say, like right now, I'm working for uh, the Research Center for Rural Development um, and Yang University. Um, uh, it's also one of the member of Vietnam National University of Ho Chi Minh City in uh, Vietnam. Uh, so right now, I'm also a founder of uh, the, the Mekong Watch and Agro Ecology Resilience. Um, so most of my work experience is on uh, gender and natural resource management. Um, agriculture based uh, livelihoods, uh, natural disaster, um, climate change, and also like community resilience. Um, at, uh, you know that like I held done uh, my master degree in Australia since 2016 and um, in, in the field of development study. Um, so um, my final thesis is uh, working on like gender and uh, the water management in the Mekong Delta. And, um, so uh, probably in the in uh, upcoming years, so I'm going to, to do my PhD in uh, Australia again. I will come back there. Um, okay, I'm, I'm so happy uh, to, to uh, talk and to share with all of you an um, um, overview of the Mekong Delta and also like a specific case um, in the Mekong Delta that the local uh, farmers, they can adapt with the plus um, every year. And uh, it's, it's the content of uh, my presentation. Like, for, firstly, I will talk about uh, the, the brief overview of the, the Delta. And, uh, and then uh, second part is um, talking a little bit about history of the plus plain areas. And the last one is how the, the local uh, community can adapt and uh, living with the plus uh, by using their indigenous knowledge. Um, yeah. So. So right now you can see um, uh, the, uh, this some of the picture that uh, I can share with you. And uh, it also talk about like um, the, the, the main livelihoods of the Mekong uh, people uh, is uh, growing um, like agricultural production. Uh, like uh, most of them uh, uh, cultivate the price, um, a very few and um, uh the the growing fruit like uh, uh mangoes and track fruit uh and um also like they develop our culture uh, most of the uh, farming model is uh, uh rising the white uh white fish uh, we also have the flat and white fish but um the white fish uh, fa uh farming model uh, is more developed uh especially in the catfish it is um, very developed in, in the Mekam Delta, um, taking the fresh water from the, uh, the, the upstream uh, areas. Uh, so next slide, you can see the map. Uh, it's uh, quite a fast uh, of the Mekong Delta. Um, so uh, the Mekong Delta play a very important uh, role in, in uh, the whole of, uh, country um, economy and food security. And um, the population is um, a car, a car for our uh, is over 21 million people. And um, uh, uh, the Mekong Delta also um, occupy about uh, 50% 50, 50 of food production of the country. Uh, it, it, so uh, it's very uh, important, as I said, like they, they contribute 20% of GDP of the country. And um, especially 65% uh, fruit growing uh, production uh, in, in the country like some kind of food that we uh, showed the picture before. And uh, you can see the map over here. 
and it's um you can see it, uh the, the Vietnam is uh located in the lower Mekong uh, basin. Um, when you uh, when we talking about the Mekong uh, region, uh, China is um, the upstream area, and then uh, we also have is around um, China, uh, Myanmar, Laos, and the the plus water come from the upstream area from China, and then it go down to Myanmar, and then Laos, Thailand, and Cambodia, and then the lower uh, lowest area uh, of the Mekong uh, region is uh, Vietnam. So uh, uh, you know, like some case, uh, some kind of years, like uh, a lot of water come from the the, the upstream area to uh, Vietnam is affecting uh, a lot, especially uh, for the vulnerable people like uh, local and poor farmer, uh, and also like for those who uh, do not own the land, um, especially for those who are living along the the river. Uh, like a loss of uh, water also affecting uh, the house and the crops for the, from the farmer. And here is the, the next, um, next to the, the, the big map of the Mekong region, you can see this, uh, the map of Mekong data over here. And we have uh, 13 uh, provinces um, in the Mekong data. So um, you can see here, Angang uh, probably is um, my hometown. Uh, I'm living uh, here. And uh, also, uh, one of, when we are talking about the Mekong Delta specifically, and Angang province is upstream uh, provinces uh, because they, they, um, take, um, they um, the, the plus water from uh, the Cambodia, they come uh, first to Angang and uh, then it go down to another province of, of the Mekong Delta. So uh, probably to say like too, too uh, much water or too little water is also affect the, the Mekong Delta from the upstream uh, countries and areas. And, and uh, just uh, uh, a quick data and um, uh, with regards to the floodings in the Mekong Delta, uh, you can see um, the the statistic over here, and um, you know, plus uh, flooding is also one of the biggest challenges uh, to the Mekong Delta, and it affect a lot, uh, especially uh, when we talking the historical floods in the past year, and we have faced um, the biggest uh, flooding in uh, 1978 um, to uh, 2002, especially in 2000, you can see. Um, it um, is about around like 600 uh, people uh, uh, is dead um, uh, by the flooding uh, reason. And uh, um, flooding not only affect the, 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 the human uh, people, but also like, um, affect the, the agricultural production, uh, the uh, rural livelihoods, like the price um, uh, cultivation. Uh, you can see uh, in the, the 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 uh, the figure uh, the second figure on the right hand side you can see and the price uh, area entirely damaged uh, by the floods um, it, it, during the the periods from 2017 and uh, uh, sorry 1978 to 19, uh, 1997 yeah and also price area with you decrease um, significantly because of a plus, yeah. And um, yeah, um, and uh, the, the last thing that I would like to share, um, you know, like um, um, the local uh, Mekong uh, people uh, from national uh, to local levels, uh, especially for um, protecting the, uh, the uh, like they want to control the plus, uh, for a, a structural measurement, the, the local government um, uh, plans to uh, build the dike uh, to protect uh, the, the people and also the crops. Uh, so uh, they, they build a lot of dike uh, uh, um, across the, the Mekong Delta. Um, not, not only is all of the Mekong Delta uh, is protected by dike, but many of the, the areas uh, will be protected uh, by dike. In uh, two, um, in, uh, in in two thousand and uh, and uh, after two thousand plus after the big flooding they build a lot of dike uh, to protect 
uh, the human uh, people and so they, they promote intensive rice production. Um, and uh, for, uh, for, the, for the local uh, community, uh, they, um, uh, they try to think about how to uh, adapt with the floodings. Uh, they, they uh, by ways of uh, proving the floating rice uh, in, in, uh, at the lo lo uh, local area. You can see uh, here the picture here also kinds of the blocking price the local farmer they they throw uh, to adapt with the plus. Uh, here the clear picture you can see and uh, the uh, blocking price um, belong right during the flood bit. You know that the blocking price kind of the price that can be developed under the uh, two meter deep uh, of the water level. So that uh, it can adapt very well with the blood uh, water. It's so it, uh, it uh, not only um, the thing that the, the local farmer use uh, to adapt with lust, but also they, it provide them a lot of benefits in terms of like income improvement and also like biodiversity. And um, you can, another picture, you can see like um, they also build the house uh, in the flooding season. Uh, um, here, here the, the, the picture that uh, we took in our project. And um, as I said before, like um, uh, promoting protein price uh, farming system is also uh, bring a lot of benefits for, uh, not only for like uh, the, the family income, uh, the household economy, but also um, give the, the benefits and improve uh, to the bio, uh, diversity and in um, um, like biodiversity and uh, environmental uh, sustainability. You can see uh, when uh, it's um, we add a space for the flooding come uh, come in inside uh, the bed field and uh, also like can uh, see a lot of birds and um, plants uh, can be developed uh, in in the flooding price areas. It also um, Good for the environment. Uh, he is um, the the local uh, staff, uh, agricultural extension staff. Uh, they work with us and uh, they um, show uh, the local farmer they can grow the upland upland crops um, after the blocking price uh, uh, season. Um, they use the draw up the blocking price uh, can can use uh, for upland crop. A farming system is, is very good because like the the grow up uh, the protein price contain a lot of nutrition uh, from the flooding uh, you know like sediment um, in, in the flooding season come to the battery field and it is a uh, keep there and it can reduce for the upland crop uh, farming system and um, for uh, us come to the conclusion so um, uh, so you know, like in, in when talking about a plus, um, the Mekong people there that are on, on way think about how to uh, live with the plus. Um, before that, they, they, they don't don't hear at the term like living with the flooding. They just think like how to prevent the flooding and control the flooding by building the dike, things like that. But um, after the the big flooding two thousand, and uh, they. They know how to um, the ways uh, to live with plus uh, because I think it's very important uh, to to uh, to adapt with the flooding, especially in the context of the uh, climate change. And uh, it's also one of the key approach in uh, enhancing like uh, ecological and social resilient farming system. And uh, so, uh, in, so indigenous, uh, I want to emphasize like, indigenous uh, knowledge uh, include. Uh, like social, cultural, and uh, uh, gender aspects that uh, should be uh, taken into account in, in the policy uh, disease, uh, policy making process, uh, especially uh, for um, the, the staff and the, the, look, the leader uh, who want to make uh, the policy a program uh, for the local community um, in, in the set of environmental uh, sustainability. And uh, so uh, the final message that I, I would like to uh, share with you, and uh, you can uh, keep in mind that, that uh, uh, adapt, adapting with the nature, not, not fighting with it. And uh, it is, um, uh, we cannot fight with the nature, uh, just uh, adapt with and live with them. 
Okay, that is uh, on up um, what I would like to share with you today. And uh, here is the, the picture that uh, uh, we took in the blockchain price uh, field. Uh, you can see I'm also in the middle of, of the picture and uh, we are the, also like uh, the young people who are working for uh, the biodiversity uh, project. Okay, uh, so uh, thank you very much for your attention. If you have any question, we can uh, uh, have discussed it in the end of uh, the um, uh, Spanulik presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tai, for a nice presentation. No? Uh, I'm very glad that you're highlighting the international lake and uh, the, to the adaptation of the climate change. Of course, sometimes uh, climate change is go beyond uh, our control and the loss and damage that indigenous people are in the front line who have to handle this. And you also prove that uh, indigenous people and indigenous knowledge can really help in uh, provide the solution and also the answer in the uh, crisis of climate change. No? So thank you very much for your story. And I can see your photo of the equally of women and men as well. So maybe later on we go in to ask you about the gender aspect. No? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Sarah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next, uh, I would like to go to our uh, next panelist. No? He also from Nepal. Uh, Mr. Sudarshan Chaudhary. He is a young sustainable heart. Uh, he has worked eight years at the Youth Federation of Indigenous Nationalities or YFIN. No? Uh, he has been working in different NGO in the issue of indigenous people rights, youth rights, and sustainable development. Currently, he is the CEO and founder of Spiral Farm House from Nepal, helping indigenous farmers switch towards fully organic through Spiral Farm House to produce a healthy and uh, hygienic food. So we're going to hear uh, Mr. Sudachan to share about how to save environment through the organic production. So the time, the time is yours. Namaste, uh, thank you, Pidawan. Uh, namaste, uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, happy to yeah, connect with you all. And uh, it's a great opportunity for me to share about uh, my experience and journey. Uh, please, okay, slide. Uh, you have thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, yeah, uh, background. Slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. Another one, I think. I think I have another presentation. Okay. Sorry, so uh, first, uh, uh -huh. is this the correct one? Uh, another one. I have uh, another presentation. Now. Oh, uh, yeah. would you mind to show from your computer? Uh, no. Uh, uh, -uh okay, okay. I'm sorry. David, I, David, I, 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 Okay, sorry, is this correct? Hello? Okay, I'm going to now uh, share a please of uh, first slide. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, Spile Farmhouse, uh, at your knowledge, uh, uh, background of our uh, work, uh, a measure of when I'm working with uh, many NGOs and uh, working with uh, indigenous organizations, I uh, travel uh, many uh, parts of Nepal and uh, I met um, uh, many indigenous uh, peoples and uh, families. How they are, uh, how we are connected uh, because indigenous uh, people are very connected with uh, nature and uh, there are main, the indigenous people's main occupation is uh, farming. And so uh, I, uh, I'm a uh, Haru indigenous background and a uh, uh, indigenous group and a uh, major occupation of Haru indigenous are in, in Nepal is our agriculture. Since uh, three to four 
ठीक है लोकल फार्मर्स स्टार्टेड यूजिंग हार्मफुल केमिकल फर्टिलाइजर फॉर देयर एग्रीकल्चर लैंड एंड इन फ्रॉम आवर रिसर्च वी फाउंड दे आर यूजिंग अबाउट 10 टू 14 किलो ऑफ हार्मफुल केमिकल फर्टिलाइजर लाइक डीएपी यूरिया पोटास व्हिच इज द अपर कट्टा लाइक आई 338.6 स्क्वायर मीटर एग्रीकल्चर लैंड व्हिच इज यूज दे आर यूजिंग नाउ and uh, it's a create uh, uh, many problems uh, in a uh, land like as a you know social health and a uh, environment so i decided to uh, start uh, with a, a spiral farm house uh, uh, to uh, start uh, how to we go in a sustainable farming uh, because the only uh, most of indigenous uh, people are uh, involving in uh, agriculture so uh, without agriculture we can't not improve their uh, livelihood their income Like as uh, education, because their main occupation is a uh, farming. So I uh, think of why I not start, uh, I not do for this. So then I start to uh, concept uh, for the small farm house and uh, started a uh, sustainable farming, uh, which is uh, uh, like as the uh, farmers are uh, facing in natural. So other farmers are facing lot of challenges in a uh, uh, farming. Like as uh, not farming only is challenges for them and affect environment and is polluted. Okay, next slide please. uh issue and challenges uh, like as uh, uh, because of using, using of uh, harmful chemicals is a play and could affect the uh, uh, the top soil of the uh, soil as are uh, going degraded and uh, soil nutrients are losing therefore crop yields are decreases uh, day by day and a uh, chemical part is cause of uh, chemical fertilizer water pollution and uh, waterway like as uh, going pollution and chemical burn the crops increase air pollution there are many effects uh, are coming uh, now day by day because uh, 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 like as a cause of environment because uh, farming like as a chemical farming is also uh, helping to uh, uh, to create problem for our environment uh, like as a health man health like as all uh, animal health uh, so because of chemical farming carbon dioxide gas is increasing according to different research different research are showing that a lot of uh, uh, issues and challenges are coming day by day now we are uh, facing uh, like as covid is so this is also cause of this a uh, lot of people are saying because uh, uh, every uh, 100 years so we are facing a new disease like this please next slide please next slide uh, as a uh, uh, farmers are using uh, harmful chemicals fertilizer uh, their ag- agriculture land they are fully dependent on the like as a uh, then uh, uh they have uh, no fertilizer the uh, without a uh, without a uh, chemical fertilizer we can uh, grow the food and uh, any product uh, because they are not believe uh, in the sustainable fa- farming practices as the farmer here uh, they are d- uh, doing uh, chemical farming uh, three to four decades uh, the price of the uh, chemical fertilizer is uh, increasing day by day uh, and uh, production is uh, decreasing Day by day, because uh, uh, their investment uh, increasing, and uh, farmer are now losing. Uh, when now uh, uh, we have a uh, uh, many uh, interview, and uh, when I we started to research, the farmer saying we are not getting any income from farming. That is a big, big uh, challenge because most of you are now living their land. Uh, they are not want to come to back to in farming uh, because they are not getting uh, all youth and all one want to a good luxurious life. They want to good life and uh, yeah. like this so yeah now people are not interested to come back because they are not getting income that is a big uh, challenge at least for us even the uh, government of nepal is so promoting chemical farming uh, and uh, they are allocate huge budget for this uh, this us we have a have a budget uh, some uh, days before and uh, this year they allocate lot of a uh, big amount for the chemical fertilizer this is a disaster for our country uh, for the farmers they are not getting uh, any profit from farming that is uh, uh, they are uh, going to protect the production and uh, produce harmful chemical like us most of indigenous farmer family uh, in farm farmers in nepal a maximum of them have a uh, less than uh, 0.5 hectare agricultural land farmers uh, have uh, no access to financial resources market and they do not have uh, good production also this next slide Uh, response to exams uh, uh, then uh, when uh, i now the chemical farming is uh, uh, affecting a lot in environment man health 
and uh, everything. It's not only like as a air, water. It's make everything of uh, pollution. So I have uh, started to uh, how to what I get knowledge from uh, farming because it's uh, not only I make a good uh, uh, production. I have a good making a good uh, profit from this. Then I started after uh, eight years knowledge. I started to train. Um, many farmers about uh, in different parts of Nepal to uh, sustainable farming, and uh, we are organized uh, uh, many seminars uh, and uh, trained them about organic farming. And uh, we have also done a consumer survey in our uh, rural municipality where I am living now uh, in uh, about organic consumption and uh, organic farming. Uh, like as now, uh, we, we found that. 50% uh, of the consumers ready to pay in uh, our rural area. They want to pay. They want uh, organic products, healthy products, hygienic products. They want to pay more, 25% than uh, chemical uh, products. But they are not found. Where where we can find? Who is organic? Now, uh, uh, so it is a big uh, action and uh, response we need to do. That also. We have also done farmers interview. We found that only one farmers are doing a uh, sustainable farming. Uh, in a forty percent farmers wanted to agriculture in sustainable sustainable way, but they are not have access to knowledge about it. How how to do? Because the past our uh, uh, like as a grand uh, pa uh, grandfather in, uh, ancestor they are doing all uh, organic way, but uh, now government is forcing. Uh, some days before I met uh, our uh, agriculture technician in our rural municipality, he is saying, Sudarshan, why you are do always uh, talking about organic?" The story of is always talking about organic because past government is uh, forcing people are not want to go in a chemical way. We we are forcing people, we are giving a uh, uh, funding people, farmers to do uh, chemical farming. They got a uh, good uh, production. Uh, now they are only believe in a uh, chemical. So why is that uh, always are uh, uh, crying and uh, saying uh, being organic, organic? It is uh, not uh, uh, good. Now people would believe only a uh, chemical farming. So uh, uh, it's a very disaster for us because our technical person who are agriculture background, they are only talking about chemical. And uh, government is talking about chemical. Uh, they are only less support for the organic farming. So we need to go to response and go to action for this. Please, next slide. Uh, uh, so we develop uh, our training manual on a uh, Biden organic uh, Farming. When we uh, found out that uh, farmers uh, want to uh, looking, farmers are looking a uh, sustainable way of farming. Uh, they want to go because they have no way because the uh, chemical is a no, no way. They one day they need to stop. They now all farmers they now. When we uh, did the uh, uh, research, uh, they now chemical is uh, not a way for us, but they have no way. So then we develop our training manual and uh, about the biodynamic organic and indigenous farming. We also did an uh, interaction program in different places uh, in our rural You can see the picture. Uh, and uh, aware people about sustainable farming and about our food sake. We also did farmer selection from the fed place uh, and uh, selected the, uh, the highly motivated indigenous farmer from uh, every place. Then we can uh, teach them to peer to peer education, like as uh, to other farmers in Delhi and go in a very quick way to. Uh, the uh, lots of farmers can get the lots of farmers. Please next slide. It is next slide. Okay, and uh, uh, we uh, help this like the highly motivated farmers to start uh, their uh, six and a half. No, so first one we are the uh, uh, provided way and uh, they are in a switch their farm in organic way. And uh, uh, training them about biodynamic organic farming and business farming techniques pro uh, provided them necessary toolkits, uh, how to uh, uh, they make a, a good compost, a quality compost. And uh, if you, uh, we feed a uh, uh, healthy compost, our soil, our soil will feed us a healthy uh, food, water, air. So uh, now we started to, please next slide, we started to uh, visit their farm and uh, see what they are doing. Uh, and they are pro uh, providing them uh, uh, necessary uh, suggestions and help if they need what, what help, what they are uh, need, we required, we giving them. And uh, we flop, 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 phone calls and uh, listen their uh, progress, challenges, what they are facing, and provide solutions, suggestions for their challenges. 
we also provide solution and things for their uh, questions if they ask us on Facebook Messenger and uh, like as farmers uh, inside groups and learn how to apply. And uh, ne next slide, please. Next slide, please. And uh, yeah, uh, this is uh, you can see uh, the farmers how they are happy and uh, they are uh, making compost. You can see. And uh, response extend in the future, uh, we are going to uh, create a uh, organic uh, cooperative in our first organic cooperative in our district uh, and uh, organize major uh, events in uh, different places and develop our uh, supply chain uh, transport uh, distribute, uh, distribution channel in the pharmaceutical of how we can get a good income. You know, we have a because we are, I already said uh, some are most of farmers are small family farmers, they have a uh, what they uh, produce first for their family and uh, then rest goes to the market. So how we collect and uh, how we can get a more income better than products and uh, train more farmers is uh, uh, trying to do soon. Okay, please, next slide. And uh, we also open our uh, 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 we also open our own shop at different cities in Nepal to sell, lake, uh, uh, sell and collect organic products from our farmers. We also be opening uh, like as a uh, soon uh, organic. Uh, you know, we are uh, trying to make uh, uh, our Shapiri district the first organic district of Nepal. Uh, uh, hope uh, we can uh, success on this. And uh, uh, like as a uh, now the theme is the uh, this uh, environment. Uh, Ecosystem restoration. I, uh, for in conclusion, uh, I say grow uh, or consume organic, save our mother earth. It's time for action. It's the time to action uh, to save our mother earth, uh, contribute from uh, your side. Uh, what a small steps we can do for our mother earth, our environment. So let's, uh, our youth, please, you are a youth, so go to action. Yeah, thank you very much, Sudachan, for sharing the inspiring okay, thank story. Thank you very much. So you really highlighting the work thank that you, you have been doing as a young farmer as well. Like you are passionate in working in the organic farming. It's not easy to to really uh, fighting with the mainstream uh, work, no? That people are using chemical and promoting on it, but you are really want to prove that uh, organic farming is the answer. Number of people believe that uh, forest can keep the carbon, ocean can keep the carbon, but land also keep the carbon and that is also protecting, uh, helping on the climate change. No? So your work is really not only uh, helping for the livelihood of the people, but also helping the planet. So thank you very much for your story and we will get back to you for the next session for the question. No? Thank you very much, Sudarshan. Okay, uh, next person, uh, I will move you again to the Mekong regions. No? Uh, I'm going to introduce you uh, to uh, Mr. Nadanai Trakan Supakon. He is a young, innovative Pakanyo from Thailand. He used to be uh, the main coordinator for Slow Food Youth Network in Thailand. Currently, he is uh, working as the Sustainable Creative and Marketing Director of Pakanyo Association for Sustainable Development, or PASD. He is also a co-founder and manager, uh, Jing Director of the Horse Beehive Thailand and Little Farm in the Big Forest. You may wonder what is the host behind a little forest, no? So we will allow Mr. Nadanai to share how he's worked with the young people to promote the indigenous food system and sustain, uh, sustainable use of natural resources. Nadanai, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pirawan. Uh, can I share my screen? Yes, please. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, Again, uh, I am Nadanai. You can call me in the short name, uh, John is my nickname. I, I do work in PASD, uh, is an NGO organization, is a Pakakayo uh, Association for Sustainable, 
and development. And uh, I do uh, social enterprise, lead the farm in big forest and host beehive. Today, I will tell you a story of a social enterprise in Karen communities in Pakakayo. But Pakakayo in Karen is uh, similar. We call ourselves uh, Pakakayo. Yeah, but you can, can search, you can see us uh, in, in uh, online on, in Karen people. No? Um, in the first, uh, very big challenge for us is uh, we do uh, rotational farming and uh, or uh, you call uh, shifting cultivation in, in the current communities. And uh, uh, we, uh, uh, the challenge is how we uh, maintain, how we uh, transmit this knowledge to the young people to, to, to make, a young, uh, make awareness to the young people. And uh, one of the big challenge for us is uh, uh, people outside in Thailand, they not understand uh, rotational farming, uh, the shifting cultivation. They think like uh, indigenous people slash and burn like that. But but in 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 fact, uh, we have uh, a lot of research. We have a lot of traditional knowledge inside the rotational farming, and this this uh, system will uh, is a uh, Main, main, main system to, to manage and take care of forests for us like that. And, and in, in our challenge is uh, we want to communicate the rotational farming by the food to people outside because food is, a, is a easy to communicate like that. And in, in current community, we, we not have only rotational farming, we have a go forestry, we have home garden like that. And the important thing is uh, we, we, we have a seasonal product and we start to think uh, how to decide the social enterprise in, in the communities. We link with uh, uh, young people, women or elders to come to, to, to uh, create the structure of a social enterprise in, in the community and uh, connect, connecting uh, the storytelling to communicate based on knowledge and identity of uh, people in communities. And uh, one, one thing is uh, we, we not want to tell them to, to plan new, new, new product, new, new species, but we, we, we talk to them uh, what, what we have now in rotational farming in our forest, like seasonal, and how do you use like that? And uh, when, when, when we find the product, in the community, we uh, do a prototype of a product and connect with a specialist. Specialist is uh, come from, uh, we do a social enterprise network in Thailand, have a young people uh, in Thailand do social enterprise, come to link together, come to help us, to, uh, to consult us to do uh, the product with the people in community, we have a lot of idea to do like that. Example, in, in Mayot community in Chiang Mai, uh, they have a lot of chili, chili, uh, local chilies. Uh, we call Karen chilies, is a uh, very popular, but we, but uh, it very difficult to eat for, for the urban people. We, we try to do uh, like a chili powder, yeah, and we we mix with a herb, seasonal herb in 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 the twelve months, twelve product like that. We we uh, uh example uh, chili uh, uh chili powder with the uh, hawa is a mint local mint of Pakakayo like that. And this uh not not only to sell to to uh, delicious, but but uh this these are uh, uh, good to communicate to people outside. We, we want to communicate that the seasonal food, seasonal product, we eat like seasonal like that. Yeah, and uh, when, when we do the product, we do uh, marketing, we create uh, the way to communicate in offline and online. And offline, we, we link with the market, uh, organic market in, in Bangkok in the big city like that. We do uh, co-organize uh, the market together like that. And uh, in online, we use social media to do, no? to, to link uh, the community and to, to the customer. And uh, the important thing is uh, we build awareness from space of experience to customers. We do a lot of workshop 
in in Bangkok, in Chiang Mai, like that. Like like uh, we we use honey to do honey tasting, and we use a taste of honey to communicate what uh what current people take care of forest, how how we do like that. Yeah, because the taste of honey will communicate the 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 taste of forest in in that time like that and we link with uh, our friend to do workshop in the community like that and this one is an example we do we we connect with a professional chef 10 professional chef have uh, two or three people uh, come from Michelin star restaurant they come to community and live with a uh, two week to learn with the uh, people in communities like that uh, three communities and we and we design menu with people in community to do like a cookbook of rotational farming to communicate people outside understand about rotational farming by the food like that and this one is a we we do database of a, a plant in the rotational farming in the last year we we found in one field in rotational farming we can we can find like a 107 species inside one field like that in major communities and we we link with the artist and the chef to do the database and do like a, a drawing the the product to do seasonal calendars and these seasonal calendars will go to uh, the school and uh, and and uh, people like in in the artists uh, way they they like this one like that and when we have data uh, we we do a pre-order marketing yeah based on the seasonal we we use this as da data to link with the marketing and uh, when when we do pre-orders when when uh, the product uh, can can uh, keep it uh, we 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 can sell it and uh, do uh, like a limited edition like that and last two years we when we do the social enterprise when we do communicate of rotational farming a lot in in the other ways uh, we we do the big festival we do like a rotational farming festival in bangkok and and we invite uh, your people in Thailand come to join together and have an exhibition, have a concert, have workshop, have a conference, international conference in, inside this uh, event. And we, we think uh, three years we will do uh, one time like that. Yeah. And this is a uh, very important for us because uh, when, when we do like this, uh, the important thing is that uh, we, we want to uh, collaboration with a partner uh, we now we have a partner uh, to do uh, like a cold shop in in two two shop in Bangkok and one shop in Sukhothai province and uh, they 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 not only to sell our product but they use our product to do the menu in in the shop like like a cheesecake of a pumpkin from traditional farming like that yeah and when we can sell the, the product we we uh, create with the communities to do community funding and to use a capacity capacity building to, in the community and social enterprise activities uh, like last year uh, we used this funding to do a fire break in the community and uh, uh, water management like that and when, when we do like this, we start to do uh, uh, to send the idea and the model to others community and establish the network. We start to use uh, the the idea of a social enterprise in the school, uh, in Kunwin school, and we we do you can see in the pictures we we have a, a box of the bees, we have mushroom, we have chicken, and uh, in this school can. Uh, the food by themselves and uh, we we talk about uh, nutrition to 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 link with the the children in the school like that and uh, we do a lot in uh, to transmit knowledge from the elder to the young people we make a space like a camp uh, like a like a 
event to uh, to invite the elders and young people go to the field together and learn each other like that. And uh, we we develop this activity to do a curriculum. Now we have uh, five school to do uh, like a, the current curriculum like that. Yeah, and and this uh, can can make uh, the young people uh, proud in own identities. This is an uh, important thing because if you want to 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 make a rotational farming can can maintain uh, you you will do like a to do uh, to send to uh, young people to proud in your own entity. This is important, and you and we use a sufficiency economy to to find the balance of a uh, business because uh, this, this business is from communities. Communities is have traditional knowledge, have a wisdom, and we be, be not businessmen, <laughs> but we want to keep uh, the traditional knowledge in the community and make it the sustainable way. And this is important to find the balance of business. And like, like in the, this case, we do uh, in Hilatai village uh, about the honey. Uh, it's very popular in that time and have a big a customer come to want like a honey from seven tons like that. But we have only 500 kilos. <laughs> We and and the elders say we use only forest grief give to us. This uh can click in my in my brain to to understand this because uh we 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 not produce more to send to seven ton, but we produce only five hundred and and send to outside only this. Yeah, and and not have an effect to the forest, not have effect to the people in communities, and we re very happy, and and we we do decision to cancel these seven ton uh, orders, <laughs> and we 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 do like a limited edition in five hundred kilos only in in this, yeah, and the the last one is uh when we meet the COVID situation, uh in okay. COVID situation. In COVID situation, we we uh, in community we we uh, close and in Bangkok in in big city we lock down, but uh, we link we use online to link them to do the list of our product and, and use online to communicate from uh, community and uh, people in the urban areas. Yeah, and this uh, is a uh, customer cooperation <laughs> in in the campaign. Uh, let us together. Yeah, you can see have a lot of menu, and I think the the last one is a uh, we we need to to do uh, raise awareness in the community a lot, and uh, every process when we do social enterprise, we we uh, decide with people in communities and we get a lot of ideas from the young people and the elders like that. Uh, we, we think uh, if we do a social enterprise, we need to understand uh, the, the wisdom and the thinking of the people in community. It makes you do in the sustainable way. And uh, I think if we do like this, we can maintain rotational farming uh, and current community will 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 save uh, the environment save the forest a lot in in the future thank you thank you very much uh, mr natadai uh, this is very uh, fantastic presentation i really love when you are uh, mentioned about your choosing to use the food as a communication <laughs> tools no to promote and highlight the indigenous knowledge, the role of indigenous people in protecting and uh, saving the natural resources. And I think this is really go along with living harmony with the nature because we don't think about money to come first, but we are thinking about the sustainable of the people and nature, like balancing these two together. And yeah, youth is very important to bringing the innovative and you are working with different partners to promote this uh, work. No? So 
congratulations and your work is doing very well and we will get back to you again on the question no? and uh, just to uh, announce to the participant if you have questions you can just type in the chat box uh, we are having the team to document your question there no? and we will get back to that thank you very much um, now uh, we will hear from the different perspective uh, we already hear from our indigenous youth who are working to promote and protect the indigenous people rights now from the cloud level. And now we're going in to hear from the another stakeholder as the uh, development organization. No? So how the development organization can engage or support the initiative of indigenous people, especially for the young people. I would like to introduce you, Mr. Vivek Chama. Uh, he is the working uh, as a national program assistant with the GEF small grant program of the UNDP in Nepal. He has worked more than uh, 20 years. He worked closely uh, in managing more than 250 community-led uh, conservation projects including climate change and also work closely with indigenous people. Prior to that, he had worked as a forest officer in Chichuan National Park with the people and the forest park, no? And also it's a joint undertaking uh, of UNDP and government of Nepal. No? Mr. Chaman Ho master degree on anthropology. He also had bachelor degree into uh, disciples forest and peel science. Today, he's going to share uh, his experience working on small grant program and how he engaged with indigenous people and indigenous youth. No? Mr. Vivek, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, clearly. Yes, sure. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for having me here. This is really a pleasure. Can you please share my slide, please? Pidawan, can you share my slide? Okay, thank you. And now I'm going to present you uh, what we are doing to restore our ecosystems. Uh, as Bariwan has said, I'm engaged with Smart Grants Program since last 20 years. Uh, and that's it. That's what I'm going to present. Next slide, please. Well, if you know, Nepal lies in in conjunction with Eurasian and Indian plates. That is, the uh, Indian plates collided with the Eurasian plates, and the Indian plates goes down, and the uh, Tibetan or Eurasian plates come up. As a result. You see, there's a, uh, the Himalayas are found because of the tectonic plates that's colliding with each other. So this, due to this conjunction, Nepal has diversities, multiple diversities. Let's see, it's, if we talk about altitude from 100, less than 100 meters to 8,848 meters, that's the highest peak, Mount Everest. If you look at the climate, then it's a tropical, it's very humid, hot climate at, the, at 100 meter uh, altitude to alpine or arctic, uh, snowy, uh, cold, chilly climates up to, up to Himalayas. Within a very small place, space in a country, small country like Nepal, we have a different ecosystem varieties, 118 ecosystem, and which includes 120 forest types alone. So talk about flowering plants, there's over, over 6,000 flowering plants, 180 mammals, including megafaunas like tigers, rhino, elephants, black bears, it is. And also uh, it's a uh, home for 850 birds. Uh, when you talk about the diversity of the people, Nepal has legally recognized 59 indigenous peoples nationalities and 
it comprises 35.8% of the total population. That's the indigenous peoples. As earlier uh, speaker said, the global population is 10% of the indigenous peoples, but Nepal alone holds 35.8% as indigenous peoples here in Nepal. Next slide, please. So ZF Small Grants Program work with local communities and it awards grants up to 50,000 US dollar to CBOs and CSOs. As already mentioned, we have funded over 250 projects. So these uh, projects, uh, the environment projects, uh, contribute to ecosystem rest restoration through community-led actions that also contribute to sustainable livelihoods. And as you know that ZF has its popular areas, that's conserving biodiversity, mitigating climate change, protection of international waters to prevent land degradations and phase out pops, chemicals, and manage the West, the uh, municipal West. And our project also addresses a number of uh, SDGs as well. So uh, if you look at the focal areas, all the focal areas contribute to the ecosystem restoration. So for example, let's go to another slide, please. Next slide, please. For example, there's a forest ecosystem conservation. Conserving forests definitely restores the ecosystem. So, so far we have a small grants program has supported to conserve 50,000, 50, 5,300 50, hectares of forest. And most of the forest, uh, for example, Kualek, Kankrebiar, Tara, Panjase, Milke Jaljale, Patna, those forests are big forests. And, and there's also a lot of indigenous peoples residing in that, uh, in that forest as well. So contributing forests not only restore the conservation, but also you know, uh, support the livelihood of the Indigenous peoples. Next slide, please. Another uh, climate change project. These are the, I mean, the introduction of uh, innovative uh, renewable energy technology promotion projects also contribute to the climate change, but also help support in restoring the forest as well. For example, we have supported solar bio, solar solar technologies, biogases, different types of biogases, uh, hydraulic ramp pump, that's the energy efficient pump. It's uh, also known as zero energy pumps, sunflower irrigation pump, and also in improved biomass technologies, such as improved cook stove, in improved cardamom dryer, improved charcoal kilns, di improved distillation units, rice house stoves. These are the, uh, renewable energy technologies is innovative uh, in the sense that it's first uh, introduced in Nepal, or it is also there is some innovation in you know application of the technology. The way you work, the way the project work, may be also innovative way of doing businesses as well. So these in uh, RET technology also you know uh, support uh, uh, the uh, reducing pressure in the forest and thereby helping in the restoration of the ecosystem. Next slide, please. Well, there's uh, another uh, area that's generally it's falls under the international waters or the biodiversity conservation uh, projects, but the wetland is very, very important as well. So wetland conservation also contributes to the ecosystem restoration. There's no denying that. So we have uh, conserved more than 6,300 hectares of wetlands that has been restored. And among the 20, the number is 20, among the 20 wetlands, four wetlands, such as Bishizari Lake, Kodagori Lake, Jagdispur Reservoir, Rupa Lakes, and Rams are the Ramsar sites. The other important aspect of the wetland conservation is many different uh, indigenous peoples rely uh, on wetlands for their livelihood as well. So conserving uh, wetlands, uh, not only you know, restore the ecosystem, but also contribute positively to the livelihoods of the indigenous peoples as well. Next slide, please. The other one is preventing land degradation. 
So, uh, if you, as you know, that Nepal is a very mountainous country. So there's a lot of sloping lands. So conserving the sloping lands through the SALT technology, that is sloping agriculture land technology, has aided in plantation of uh, 5.3 million plants. That's the majority of the, uh, the majority of plants is broom grass that's planted in a clump. So the number is really high. 4.5 million uh, broom grasses are planted and that's benefiting 5,800 households. That's a purely with the Indian peoples, that's the Indian Japans and Tamans. The other one is conserving uh, river cutting, especially in the plain lands. And we have also promoted a traditional way of conserving the use of bamboo baskets. You can see in the picture the, the far uh, right at the top, at the bottom, those are the bamboo baskets used and the stone belts are kept in the bamboo baskets. So it prevents uh, river cutting in, in some way. So, next slide, please. Well, uh, I just wanted to highlight a, a few projects. That's, I mean, one, one project, not few, but one project that is also uh, related to earlier presentation by notes. That's uh, sifting cultivation. The Japan's Indian Stepans and Tamangs, they also uh, practice sifting cultivation. In Nepalese term, this is known as Korea Fadani. Sifting cultivation or slash and burn agriculture, uh, jhum, or whatever the terminology is. It's a very, very sustainable agriculture. But the problem is in Nepal, since the Chepangs are very, very marginalized community and they used to hold, uh, own the lands earlier, but these days the lands become a very scarce, uh, scarce resources for the Japans. They uh, virtually live in a very, very steep lands and still they are practicing the sifting cultivation. But the problem is the fallow period is very, very less, or even it's a, a kind of for example, this sifting cultivation, if the fallow period is 10 years, then that's the very, very sustainable agriculture. But in Nepal, the sifting cultivation is practiced in, uh, with, with or without no fallow periods. It's a yearly day planted in the same places. There's no kind of day. Uh, I, cannot, I cannot say it's a sifting cultivation, but I can say it's slash and burn. Whatever grow this, they, they chop it and they burn it. And then again, they started the plantation. And again, the next year, the same cycle continues. There's no sifting, but the slash and burn is, is there. So uh, uh, slash and burn agriculture without any uh, fallow period is very, very uh, uh, depleting to the environment. It's, it, it loses a lot of soils. The, it's erosion and even triggers landslides. So uh, sometimes the burning also destroy forests or villages as well. So in 2008 or 2000, since 2008 and 2012, we supported two projects and that directly work with the Japans and Tamans to initiate sloping agriculture land technology as a salt technology. And uh, we converted uh, nearly 3,000 3, hectares of Korea land, that's slash and burn agriculture, into productive agriculture by using salt technology. You know, the salt technology is de developed uh, in Philippines. So basically, it's, uh, you know, uh, we promote that technology here in Nepal. So when the production is there, also, you need uh, you know, marketing. So within that community, Mr. Rajkumar Praza, he's a Chapan, young, young Chapan. And he started social enterprise in a sense that whatever uh, the sifting cultivators or the Chapans and Tamans produces from their Korea land through this uh, sloping agricultural land technology or agroforestry, he will buy it in a cash. 
so that the producer do not have to worry about the, the money. Sometimes what happens is whatever they produce, the uh, entrepreneurs will buy in credit and they only give uh, the money after six months. So it's really, really not a good practices. So uh, he started his business and he's now he used uh, purchases banana, pineapple, broom grasses, whatever they grow in the Korea land. They, uh, he purchased it and his annual transaction is 150,000 US dollar. So in the far right at the, at the bottom, there was a clip from UNDP Nepal and it said that my family will not have to die of hunger. So it's a uh, it's one community that uh, uh, the property level is very high. The other, next one, please. Next slide. Uh, Chepang's also worship uh, a jury tree, that's Basia Puteresi. And they have a very close affinity with the tree. And, uh, and they used to give this tree as a dowry to, the, to, a, to their daughters when they get married. So they basically would not give or fail the tree. SCP respecting their culture, uh, you know, support, also supported to uh, introduce B in that area because uh, Chiuri or Bastia bitteraceae is very, uh, very good B flora. And we started with 80 households in the Silinge called in Makwanpur. So again, we develop a, another social entrepreneurs within the community and his, his name is Mr. Dennis Chapan. And he also established another social entrepreneur enterprise and his annual turnover by selling the honey is 125,000 US Next, please. So uh, SCP in Nepal has closely worked with IPs in ecosystem restoration and landscape conservation. This includes the nomadic routes. That's only one uh, nomadic tribes here in Nepal. As mentioned, uh, we work with Japan Tamans with the septings, septing cultivations, gurus with uh, conserving forests, taros in Indian knowledge management, as well as wetland management and forest management, Magar, Newar, Pishukarma. Uh, they're with the uh, conserving forests and introducing uh, renewable energy technologies. Sherpas, that's the Highlanders. They, uh, we work with them to conserve the Alpine uh, pasture lands. Rai, Kumal, Danwar, Bankaria, Pool, Raji, Bote, and Majis. We also work with them with the different uh, types, different innovative solutions uh, uh, to, to restore the ecosystem as well as improve their livelihood as well. And while uh, SCP is working, uh, we, SCP Nepal has won 46 awards, including nine international awards. And the good news is that 50% of the award is won by the IPs. Next, please. So uh, we have a diversity, as I have already mentioned. It poses diverse challenges as well. And, but it also has a diverse opportunity and choices as well. So I mentioned that we have supported 250 projects. That's a very, very diverse kind of innovative projects. And that's why one of the reasons that I, I was still working with the small grants program since last 20 years is I'm still always learning new things doing the projects. Uh, again, now in order to sustain these projects, conservation initiatives need to be linked with either money-making or money-saving saving endeavors. Money saving endeavors such as uh, introduction, introduction of uh, uh, renewable energy technology, it, those are the money saving endeavors. But whereas the other, uh, if you do a businesses or link with the enterprise, then it's a money making in, in endeavors. Uh, indigenous knowledge and practices are binding factors of restoring ecosystem. Because when you uh, work with the Indian people, their practices should be respected. And if you, you know, apply partially or fully those practices, then you can easily bind those community together so that we can easily initiate any kind of projects. 
Likewise, while working with IPs, innovative and flexible approaches needs to be taken. For example, when we started uh, uh, the Korea Farani or the uh, introducing salt technology uh, in sloping land with the Chepangs, uh, we discussed a lot with the uh, Chepang communities so that what kind of, what species should we initiate in, in this flash and burn area. So they identified uh, banana, pineapple, and uh, broom grasses. But when we started that, we never know that whether the, in the Korea or the sloping lands, whether this, this uh, crop will yield or not. So what we did is we use, although we started it, we didn't say that uh, we have a separate, you know, sec secret, uh, flexible and you know compensation mechanism if the crop fail we will compensate but we didn't communicate with them but we kept it secret secretly we started it because if the crop fails the Japangs and tamangs will not get what they get from the sifting cultivation they used to get so we use sec secretly that we uh, allocated some fund so that if the crop fell we'll compensate so that they don't have to worry about their livelihood. But we didn't communicate with them. But fortunately, the crop is very good. So we don't have to use that one as well at all. So uh, SCP Nepal also serves as a grant maker for us. We are not uh, uh, donors, but we are grant makers. And we also support grantees to build capacities. We just, we, simply we don't give funds but also we support it with their capacity building. For example, we organize um, uh, annually uh, review uh, learning workshops. We organize training for uh, capacity building, such as the uh, uh, gender and mainstreaming, JC, we call it, gender and social inclusion uh, trainings, financial management training, participatory rural appraisal training. So we also build their capacity as well. So uh, at the last, the way forward is ESCP is actually a funding opportunity for IPs as well as youth. ESCP always encourages innovation and application of Indian knowledge and Indian practices in ecosystem restoration. So in, in SCP in 2021, we initiated three projects with the IPs that is related to renewable energy technology. And last time when we organized uh, uh, in April, this April, when we organized a learning camp review workshop, and that's the good thing was that it's 70% of the project is led by the youth team leaders. So uh, we are a small grants program in Nepal. We are here to support the IPs and youth if they have if you have a very innovative solutions. And if you have you know how to do businesses, you, you can always you know, knock the door with this small grants program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vivek, for your sharing. It's very interesting how the UNDP try to engage with indigenous people and also giving the opportunity for indigenous people to engage with UNDP through the grant. And it's really happy to hear that uh, around 70% is the youth initiative. That is uh, very wonderful. And it's very, uh, how to say, wonderful to see that the number of successful story that awarded is also from Indigenous People Project, no? So thank you very much for your sharing and we will get back uh, with you for the session on Q&A. So we back. Let me yeah, stop yeah. the share because, okay. Okay, now uh, we already complete uh, our five speakers who are sharing their work and experience you know, from their ground level and as well as uh, national level. So now uh, I would like to give the time for participants. If you have any question, please, uh, you can raise your hand or you can type your question in the chat box. And then we will, uh, you can unmute yourself and raise the question. And please also specify which question that you want to ask to which speaker, no? Then we can uh, 
directly asking our panelists. I'm not sure the team can help me to find uh, in the chat box. Are there any questions? Yeah, one. There are questions in the chat box. Yes. Okay. Uh, maybe uh, I will start with the. Uh, I think this is the, the the first one. No, the question to Basha uh, regarding to the Baidawa practice. Uh, is it legally uh, recognized in Nepal? And what are the challenges that we are facing uh, due to the environmental challenges? Basha? Yeah. Answer the question. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Prem, sir, for, the, for, for your uh, query. Uh, it's very relevant uh, to the scenario of Baidava. So Baidava are uh, traditional medical practitioners who have traditional authority, but um, there is not any uh, legal certification from the government of Nepal as of now. So however, they've uh, got themselves registered in Department of Cottage and Small Industries and have got a ban uh, for their practice. So yeah, there is no legal <laughs> certification as such uh, from a Nepal government. Um, talking about challenge, um, I'll, I'll just talk about the wholesome challenge uh, rather than just climate change. So uh, Baidava is a, pra uh, a service-oriented um, practice where they do not charge any fees or for diagnosis or treatment. So um, income generation from this uh, practice is uncertain. Furthermore, if they start charging fees um, for treatment, uh, um, complications as the, uh, like, as they are not medically certified uh, practitioners, and um, neither they have a legal authority or legal um, certification from Nepal government. Um, another challenge could be um, that, you know, by the way, um, when I had a conversation with them, uh, they stated that they have this uh, seasonal problem of uh, drying this uh, twigs and roots of uh, medicinal plants um, during rainy or um, rainy or winter seasons, to which NGP has supported uh, them with a solar dryer. Um, so, you know, support rather solve their problem uh, by giving them solar dryers. So, you know, we have been uh, receiving uh, a positive feedback from by device and uh, after the usage of solar dryer. Um, yeah, so I, I don't think there is any um, challenge in, is in respect to climate change because the availability of medicinal plants, uh, according to Baidavas, uh, they, don't, they don't see it as a challenge because they have been growing, uh, they themselves have been growing these medicinal plants uh, in their courtyard. So sometimes they go to forest to collect these um, medicinal plants uh, uh, and the, most of the plants that they use are grown in their own courtyard. So yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Basha, for your answer. I think that it's really good that they still can uh, practicing and then have the resources available for them. No? Uh, okay, uh, I will go to the next question. This question is uh, direct to Mr. Tai. Tai, your question is, how is the government supporting to the floating farming practice and the indigenous knowledge and the technology which have proved the role of Blessing in floating agriculture and protection of biodiversity. Hi, uh, Pira, Pirawa. Thank you uh, for your questions. And I think it's a it's an interesting question and uh, to talk about um, the policy um, aspects. So um, you know, as I said uh, in the, my presentation, so after two thousand is uh, from the big uh, flooding in Mekong Delta. So. Uh, it's, it's a long time until now. Um, we just ha held the uh, de re uh, decision uh, of the policy maker uh, from uh, at national level. They, they issue about uh, the debris 120, uh, the local, the government, national government support and encourage local farmer to uh, practice um, eco uh, farming system. Uh, but uh, specifically for the blocked in price area. So, 
you know, it, it's um, it's quite hard to to make a train because like they they build a dike um um many in many parts up of the Mekong Delta, so it's a uh, physical infrastructure. So it's it's so hard to <laughs> to make trains, but uh, for some of the uh, other areas uh, are not dike uh, cover, so they can uh, encourage uh, farmers to. Uh, to uh, promote uh, this kind of uh, the model, like blockchain price model, and uh, I think um, uh, want to uh, people want to uh, pursue and practice uh, blockchain price farming system. They also uh, use uh, their indigenous uh, knowledge um, from their uh, parents, from their uh, past generation, uh, very very well, and they can share it uh, to another uh, areas around the Mekong Delta. Yeah, so right now they uh, the, the national government is support for um, the farmer who, who run um, the eco-based uh, farming system uh, try uh, w w to adapt for the flooding. You know, like it, in the Mekong data is not uh, specific and it's not the uh, flooding is the only one disaster, but we also had to face with a lot of challenges like mm -hmm. stone institution uh, land subsidence and many things coming uh, to the Mekong Delta now, but uh, I just want to share uh, one specific case of the floods adaptation. Yeah, thank you very much for your question. Thank you very much, uh, Thai. That's a uh, very clear answer on that. It's good that the government has also played the role in supporting this uh, initiative, no? Uh, next question, uh, going to Sudarshan. Sudarshan? Uh, the question is going to you is what are the practic practical and legal challenge in promoting organic farming? Are there any challenges in thank promoting? You. Oh, thank you, uh, for the uh, question. Uh, what are the practical and legal challenges uh, for the uh, promotion of organic farming? Is the mostly of uh, First, the uh, for the uh, transformation, like as of in uh, uh, farmers, they are doing a chemical way of farming. Uh, they need to uh, be transformed their farm in uh, organic. It uh, mm -hmm. takes time, mm -hmm. like as a, and uh, most of uh, uh, they need to make uh, their soil a good fertile and uh, viable, like as a uh, uh, good. Uh, if I uh, make uh, the good compost and a uh, lot of compost, uh, so uh, now uh, people are uh, having a uh, less uh, animal like as a uh, cow, mm -hmm. buffalo, and uh, because uh, in Nepal, uh, most of our uh, uh, family farmer are uh, like as a uh, not only like as a uh, we say uh, a mixed family farm, mixed farming, not only like as a uh, livestock and agriculture, they are doing a mixed farming. Mm -hmm. Like uh, they have some goat, some cow, some chicken, some pigeon, mm -hmm. like as yeah. Uh, mixing, they are not only one is like as a orchard farming, not only like as a rice grower, uh, the wheat grower like this. So uh, uh, now uh, uh, people are like as a farmers are, they are uh, uh, going to very less uh, animal in their farm because they have uh, no compost and uh, no cow dung and uh, fallow dung and uh, they are making very less compost in their farm. So for transformation is a uh, very challenges. Uh, for them, how to get compost, how to make compost if they have no resources, mm -hmm. because the lack of resources uh, and uh, another is a uh, knowledge. They have no, 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 no any training, no knowledge mm -hmm. about how to, because past they are doing, but now uh, they are th uh, uh, their land is going uh, degraded and uh, uh, very less fertility. So they are only thinking only way organic, uh, only chemical farming can another is the uh, uh, le, uh, or the government support uh, the government support is the like as a, uh, a most uh, uh, need to promote the organic farmers who, who want to go switch their farm in organic uh, and need to support like as a government now giving a lot of a big amount for subsidy for chemical farming so if some farmers want to do in organic way, they need to promote them. Mm -hmm. uh, they allocate budget and uh, give a start training and uh, like as a seminars about the organic farming and uh, other uh, legal identity like as a uh, organic certification. Now uh, mm -hmm. in our local area and uh, even in uh, only we we have uh, some uh, international certifier, but in the like as a Nepal government and municipality like as a province not certified any organic products. 
if uh, we start to certify by like as a, some groups, like as a, some uh, Nepal government, uh, like as a local municipality, uh, this is this product uh, this, from this farmer, from this farm, this is uh, organic. And then, then it's uh, uh, have an uh, identity. That's also promote uh, for the, like as a, if uh, I'm from, uh, uh, not from same village, another, when I send my product to like a big market, then uh, the consumer, they did not believe uh, this is organic or not organic. Because for the international certification, uh, uh, these the local farmers, a small family farmers cannot pay like as his amount, mm -hmm. uh, thousands of dollars they need to pay for the certification. So that is also a big challenge for uh, a promotion of the organic farming. If uh, they have a, a local certifiers, like as a government, local government, local body certify them for organic, uh, then it's uh, good for the, like as a, even in the big cities, they can sell their product in high price. That is also another uh, uh, good opportunity to promotion of the organic farming and uh, government and uh, state, uh, province and rural uh, municipal level, rural municipality need to uh, promote, like allocate budgets and uh, start to uh, like as a promotion of the farming in many ways. And or another is a market is, is when uh, uh, a small farmer they produce, they have very small way, a small portion. They have uh, like as a, a small family farm, uh, they first grow for their family, and then is a race that goes to market. So they have a very small things and a lot of farmer, they have a come with a small portion of uh, things in the sale their market. You see when uh, we go to the local farmer's market, they come for a small uh, products, which are very less products. And it's quite a big, big. Then uh, it's, uh, it's just to, uh, it's just hard to assist the market also. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much to that and that highlight also the challenge and recommendation to the government how the, the, they can support, no? Uh, okay, uh, let me go to the next question. Mr. Nadanai, it's uh, also quite similar question. What are the practical and legal challenge in upscaling the social entrepreneurship? Okay, uh, yeah. I, I, would, I will talk uh, two sides. Uh, uh, the legal side uh, for us is not, have challenged too much because uh, we we do in Thailand we do like a social enterprise Thailand and and we come to join like a member in 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 that in that uh, organization and and uh, this organization will uh, do like uh, to push the the policy of a social enterprise in Thailand and and we have a cabinet resolution of social enterprise in in last year. And and this legal uh, this policy is very support us to to support uh, the the entrepreneur about a social enterprise and uh, they link a lot about a uh, uh, policy like that yeah in in I think in in policy level uh, we we okay in social enterprise and but the main challenge is of uh, our social enterprise to upscaling is uh, in the practical way. Uh, because uh, we in 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 the first uh, last three year we do like uh, two or three community together like that yeah and we work a lot not not only work in uh, social enterprise uh, activities but we work to capacity building we work to uh, collect a trend. Tradi uh, traditional knowledge uh, to do curriculum like that and and work a lot <laughs> in, in in the communities and uh, and uh, I think uh, the main challenge to upscale is uh, the system of uh, of uh, community branding work because uh, when 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 they do they do like a, uh, they they do the farming like a, in the seasonal and we have a seasonal product very limited yeah and uh, some of a uh, fresh of a uh, fruit or fresh vegetable is very difficult for us to transport to to customer because like like in Bayard, we we have a uh, seven hours to to transport to Chiang Mai and to Bangkok is 12 hours is very far but but uh, we we try to adapt to find a way how 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 we do like that and and we find and we find uh, uh they they have a uh, traditional knowledge to uh, to do with uh, this product like that like uh, to dry it to ferment it like that yeah and and can can have a long shelf life uh, by by that and uh, and now we 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 can we can we can do the product like this a lot, like a fermented honey like that. 
<laughs> yeah, and and uh, now now in in this year we upscale from from three community to seven community because we use online, online a lot because now I I cannot go to communities because uh because uh now community is closed but we use uh Facebook we use. Uh, telephone like that yeah to to consult about the product how to manage product how to send the product like that I, I think uh, we we can find an uh, easy way to 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 upscale and and uh, the thinking of upscale of social enterprise for us I, we think uh, we upscale slowly but strong this this is a main point for us thank you thank you very much for addressing the challenge as well as how you redress the challenges no thank you very much and uh, i would like to go uh, to the last question for our uh, last panelist as well mr vivek uh, this question is go to you how forest ecosystem conservation respect the human rights of indigenous community because uh, we hear a lot of militarization and criminalization in the name of conservation in Nepal. Yeah, Mr. Vivek, uh, would you like to answer the question now? Thank you. Thank you very much, Pemzi, for that question. I agree that the, uh, there's a lot of militarization and criminalization, especially in the protected area uh, that's in uh, around the national parks. Uh, and buffer zones of the national parks and protected area or conservation area. And that's, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's true as well in certain degrees, but it is uh, these days in terms of the you know, criminalizations and all those things, it's kind of reducing when there is a, uh, when government started declaring uh, buffer zones within the protected area systems because the buffer zone is managed by the locals. So uh, uh, that's one thing I want to share. But in our cases, in small grants program, whenever we try to uh, initiate forest conservation, we work, not only we work you know, with the CBOs or the CSOs, but we also closely with the work with the government Without their government support, we don't initiate any projects to conserve the forest because still uh, the national forest is still owned by the government. So we simply, we don't uh, act alone. I mean, we also work with the local government. Whenever we initiate a project, we start, you know, uh, inception workshops as well as midterm review workshops and final workshops. So we, uh, throughout the conservation, uh, implementation of projects, we cl work closely with the government as well. So, uh, so far, we haven't encountered any kind of those, you know, obstacles or the criminalized, you know, militarized in, in our SCP projects. And one project we have done is, is the, uh, we work with the routes, the nomadic routes, and their rights was that they uh, move from one place to another. So when they move from one place to another, they always you know, look around the forest area. So, uh, and that forest, uh, uh, they try to ban entering, ban them entering the forest. So what we did is we you know, work with the routers and we also work with the local government. We also work with the forest department. We also work closely with the, uh, uh, local government. So we, uh, we had a series of dialogue and uh, we had a kind of agreement that whenever they travel, they move from one place to another forest, they should be allowed to enter the forest. So their rights of the you know, use of the forest was, uh, was granted with, with the interaction and with the, with the series of dialogues. So uh, basically my answer to that question is, Whenever we work, we work in a group. So individually, you can criminalize any person. But when we work in a group, the chances of criminalization is very, very less. So that's what the lessons we draw from the art project. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Vivek. Yeah, it's, it's challenging and this thing, it cannot be stand alone. I agree with you on that. Uh, so 
it's now it's already four and of course i think there's uh, still a lot of questions but in the time is already <laughs> due so i would like to give the floor to mr prem singh karu he is uh, having the lawyer background and he is working as asia international Tour test as the environment program officer so i would like to give the floor to prem to giving the closing remarks Thank you very much, Pira One, and thanks uh, all of the colleagues who are uh, here directly connecting via Zoom and who are watching us uh, via Facebook Live. So our all the panelists they they brought up very insightful informations regarding the environmental issues and the environmental challenges what indigenous communities are facing and what the indigenous peoples have been doing the practice to restore those challenges, means the environmental challenges. Our panelists and our opening remark <coughs> speaker, Chandra from Bangladesh, see, share us very insightful information. There are lots of environmental challenges. Those challenges, it's either relating to climate change, it's landslides, and other degradations, environmental degradations, those are imposing lots of challenges and affecting our indigenous practices. And because of those uh, effects, those impacts, our rights means which we indigenous peoples uh, deserve, which we uh, <clears throat> inherit because of being indigenous, are being means are keeping us away to live our dignified and self-determined life. Bursa Lekhi, who, who brought the issue of uh, uh, traditional herbal uh, medicinal practice, that practice is really very vibrant and very, very uh, useful because, because that practice has inherent with the indigenous knowledge, traditional practices, and completely depending on the nature because all kinds of herbs, are in the nature, are in the forest, are in the land. And the use of those, those herbs are only what quantity we need. It's not that we are doing the work of like the extractive industries. So our practices, whatever we do in the name of, uh, uh, in the name of traditional practices for um, uh, medications, for our livelihoods, for our culture, all those are very environment friendly. And we have, that's why we have very inherent relationship as a culture, as a, uh, as a, uh, uh, as a uh, social practices, and as well as, as a, you know, means our uh, agricultural practices. And there is need of knowledge transfer, but our colleagues, they flagged, it's our all colleagues, all panelists, they flagged the knowledge transfer. It's very, uh, very dynamic and very important that need to go from one generation to another. And the Baidawa traditional, that uh, herbal medicine practice from one generation to another is really very inspiring story and very encouraging. The similar practice was also shared by our colleague from Thailand. The indigenous youths who are in the city, they are going back to their village and they are doing, they are promoting their social entrepreneurship it's the products from the rotational farming, the products of the forest, and so on. That's really encouraging and inspiring for others. And our colleague from Vietnam, yeah, means the indigenous peoples, what they are doing the practice of floating rice farming. Those floating rice farmings are based on indigenous knowledge and technologies rather than the modern. And those indigenous knowledge and technologies, even during the disasters, flood itself, the disaster. So they have they have built up, they have strengthened their capacity, their knowledge, their skills to resilient those floods. And they are growing their agriculture products. They are they are doing their livelihoods. They are surviving with that resiliency even in the flood. That's really awesome. And thank you very much for sharing this this uh very convincing story, very convincing information from from uh, Vietnam. Our, our indigenous peoples, we are always 
in the landscape where there are natural resources. And those landscapes are always in the reach of disasters. Those disasters are not because of us, but those disasters are because of the climate change, because of the, because of the industries or because of the other human activities, which we don't do, but someone else doing, and that's affecting to our landscapes. Flood, drought, uh, uh, landslides, and so on. And we are being the victim. And out of all the practices, we, which we say we are indigenous, and those indigenous practices are based on our those, you know, means the nature uh, in the forest, in the land, uh, in the agricultural practices are our identity. And those practices, if being affected because of the environmental challenges, because of the environmental issues, then our identity is also being challenged. Then the, uh, then the potentiality of displacement, then the reach of uh, you know, means uh, declining of our identity and, and, and practices. So it's, it's really very important to highlight our, all these uh, indigenous knowledge practices, as well as what youth have been doing. It, 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 needs, to be, uh, it needs to be highlighted and it needs to be as the uh, motivational stories and, uh, uh, and, 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 and the sharing of information, you know, through different, uh, uh, different source of uh, technologies, uh, source of social media that can reach up to all levels of youth, not only indigenous, but other youth as well. And Sudarshan as a youth, what he has been doing is really very, very appreciative because the chemical, the chemical fertilizers and the farming's based on the chemical fertilizers using pesticides that destroying the uh, that destroying the quality of the land that that polluting that contaminating to the soil that contaminating to the air to the uh, uh, to the water so because of that contamination of what we eat what we breathe means we are not breathing the healthy air we are not eating the healthy foods we are not eating the nutritious food so all these things means this right to health is also our basic human rights, fundamental human rights. So as, as an uh, organic farmer, as a youth organic farmer, Sudarshan is also contributing lots. And of course, we can understand the legal challenges, means the product, how you can, you know, means uh, uh, how you can uh, create the access to a proper market, proper pricing and branding and all and support from the government, those are always challenges, certification always challenges, but whatever you are doing, that's you, you have already started to build up the, you know, means a uh, 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 big campaign. And that campaign will hope, will, will, will expand uh, further. It's not only be limited only in your Saptari district, but across Nepal and uh, out of Nepal. So, so yes, and while doing those organic farming, you are using your indigenous knowledge and technologies. You are using your skills. And the farmers who had their indigenous uh, uh, knowledge and technologies, but they, but they were compelled to flow the, those chemi chemical pesticides and the uh, hybrid farmings, means now they're also getting opportunity to restore back their knowledge. And the, because of that, opportunity, they are, re, they are restoring the ecosystems, they are restoring the agriculture, they are restoring, they are restoring the nature, they are restoring the mother earth, land, soil, and water. That's really awesome, and we must appreciate it. And our colleague from Thailand, uh, Nuta Nut is uh, difficult to pronounce the name. I'm sorry if my pronunciation is wrong. So the indigenous peoples who are doing rotational farming, who are collecting the forest products and those those their rotational the products of rotational farming the, the products of the forest they are they are developing as a social enterprises it's not only being limited the indigenous knowledge and skill product things within the indigenous communities but they are trying to scale off and they are trying to make the uh, make their economic status stronger that's that's really uh, motivational at least people who use those pro products they know how the products is produced because there are the stories. He said, we have the story and we are trying to connect the story and we are trying to communicate the story with the users, up to the users. So that's that's really very convincing and appreciative actions what you're doing in Thailand. 
and that that's the best way to transfer knowledge and that that's the best way to promote our indigenous knowledge and practices and it's also the best way to 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 uh, to disseminate what our identity is and yeah so i completely agree with him yes please give us enough what we need so uh, i already told in the uh, in the beginning we are not the uh, extractive industries we we use how much means as much as we need we don't you know bring any store to as as a uh, in a in a in a, a huge amount uh, we use as a seasonal things we use as a you know means our our uh, uh, livelihood we use as of our culture not as a industry not as a uh, uh, devastating I am Vivek Sharma from Nepal, the colleague from uh, UNDP as ecosystem uh, restoration projects they have been implementing in Nepal since many years. And those are really important. And the, the ecosystem restoration through uh, forest conservation, through wetland conservation, through agricultural practices, and through preventing the land, uh, 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 preventing the land degradations and soil regions. That's convincing, and that's the best way to do uh, means to 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 do the ecosystem uh, restoration. And in addition to doing uh, all these uh, all these practices of ecosystem restoration, there is need of participatory approach of community engagement. And he was showing the photo, and we we're showing how the community they are engaging. So without the community ownership and participation of the communities, restoration can't be sustainable, even we do for a while. So if we really want to do the sustainable ecosystem restoration, there is need of participation of the local communities, participation of the indigenous, indigenous peoples, and those participation and the practice of all those ecosystems, whatever we are doing, the actions, whatever we are doing, if those ecosystem practices, actions are based on indigenous knowledge and technologies that can sustain forever. It's, it's not for just time being, means for a season, then after rain, you suppose if they are doing something, after, after rain, it, it swaps away. So it's not the way we have to do the practice of restoration. We have to do the practices in a sustainable way that can be always the environment friendly and always uh, conserving the nature, biodiversity and all. So I agree with him. He said indigenous knowledge and practices are binding factors for restoring ecosystems. It's globally agreed, the world it trust. So whatever we are doing, let's keep on doing. And you youths are the change maker. You youths are the uh, communicators. You youths are the agent of change. And you, you youth should be now the knowledge bank of our, all these indigenous knowledge and practices that can that can carry the good masses and that can help to really, you know, means conserve the environment, conserve our uh, mother earth, and keep the healthy and and prosperous uh, 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 environment. So thank you very much, all of you, and we must acknowledge the uh, activeness uh, and contribution of the colleagues who. Who, who, who really uh, engaged yeah, since the very beginning of this webinar. We must thank to David from uh, uh, UNESCO Bangkok office and our all Asia Indigenous Youth uh, Platforms uh, team members and our IPP uh, colleagues uh, who we are here uh, engaging in different responsibilities and making it possible. So thank you very much and hope we will keep on doing uh, this, what we have been doing the best, and our, all these actions are, all these collect, collective actions are necessary to restore the ecosystem. So let's keep on, let's hold the hand, and let's keep on doing the partnership, and partnership networking can make the change, and can connect and share the information, which motivates to do something better than what we have been doing. So thank you very much, all of you, and again, lots of thanks will be connected somewhere again in different webinars. So happy environment day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prem. And thank you for our panelists and everyone for your active participation. And kindly help us to fill in the form for the survey on evaluation. From now, the session is ending. So thank you everyone and see you next time.
wherever we can meet again online or physically. Thank you very much. สวัสดีค่ะ